And we are back on tape. I am sorry for you having to see this face. Anyway, welcome back to The Bad Word. I am your host, Jeb Bush, telling you to please watch the show. Please. I'm begging you. America. Anyway. Uh, first on my, agenda to, on my agenda tonight is the Iowa and New Hampshire caucuses. Oh, and as you can see, we, uh, we stepped our game up. We got the, we got the tablet. Uh, yeah, that, oh, there it is. Tablet. Um, and it, it, it's, it's like two and one. Yeah. As you can see, my, okay, well, no, my, uh, my, my, my budget for the show does still fit inside of a shot glass, but I got new equipment. So let's get to this shit. As I was saying, uh, the Iowa and New Hampshire caucuses. Uh, in the Iowa caucuses, Ted Cruz and Hillary took it. Even, and um, <clears throat> New Hampshire, uh, it was Trump and Sanders. Now, first I want to start with Iowa, though. Oh, there, there's also some controversy in that. Uh, there, well, yeah, there was some controversy in, that, in those Iowa caucuses. Um, well, basically, uh, well, okay, here's how it went down. It was like neck and neck between Clinton and Sanders. And, uh, well, <laughs> the way they, uh, it, yeah, it was a virtual tie between them at 49%. And the way they settled the tie was a, a, a series of coin tosses. And this, yeah, yeah, they actually did that. And that is what brings me to, uh, well, the way I feel about Iowa and how I don't think it means anything because how can you really trust a state that decides who won, um, well, a vote between two people who are going to run the country, who, who want to run the United States with a coin toss? See, here's how I see it. The Iowa caucuses are a microcosm of the entire election. Uh, they, called, they, or they called Hillary the apparent winner, just like they seemed to do when this race, like, b before this race even started. Everyone just assumed Hillary was going to win. And little did they know that the Jewish engine that could was just going to keep on chugging. But this kind of brings me to uh, something a little bit bigger, and it's the, the, the difference, or the perceived, I should say, the perceived difference of Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. Pragmatism versus progressivism. Now, the biggest knock against Bernie Sanders, other than his age, uh, yeah, other than his age, and I love Bernie, but fuck that guy is old, or at least he looks old. Nah, he's old. Let's be honest. He is fucking old. But the other biggest knock against him is that the things that he's pro that he is proposing, you know, uh, free health care and free education and free college, they can't get done. They're pipe dreams. But just for the hell of it, just for shits and giggles, uh, why don't we look at what people like Donald Trump and Ted Cruz are proposing? Now, I have a question. What exactly is so practical about turning an entire region into glass or building a giant wall to close you off from another country and having that country pay for your wall? As if, like, as if this is Berlin after World War II. Or what's, what is so, another question is, what's so practical about tagging Muslims like they're dogs or just banning them altogether? See, maybe to a racist asshole, that's practical, but uh, to a person with, I don't know, compassion and common sense, it's not. Those are not the solutions of rational people. Now, those... To me, those are the solutions of the, pe of the types of people who, who would call you a nigger when you 
play Call of Duty on Xbox Online. Now, basically, basically what I'm saying is that those, Im those solutions are immature, and they're, they're for Im they're the, they are the solutions of immature and petulant children. And, and just, this is just me personally. I don't feel like they, I don't think that they have a place for, like there's no place in that for the most powerful position in the world. Now on to Clinton and Sanders. <clears throat> Hillary Clinton. She is seen as progressive by many, but also seen as the realistic, safe candidate. And that's what makes her more viable than Bernie Sanders, because she is the perfect balance between those two notions. Well, I, I do agree. She's very practical. And she's running a very practical campaign. And what I mean by that is Hillary Clinton is running the campaign that we expect of a politician. And, and the, the biggest indicator of that is the way she's financing her campaign. And that's with a lot of large donations. She's received over 700 donations from, C, from, from CEOs. Bernie Sanders, on the other hand, has received less than 50. The Sanders campaign has also averaged only $27 per donation. Billionaire George Soros gave, pro, gave a pro-Hillary Clinton super PAC $6 million with just one. We all say that politicians take too much money from big donors, but, you know, that's just how you win. So, nothing we can do about it. Well, not quite. See, Bernie Sanders could have taken that route. He could have taken big, you know, big donations and said, uh, well, you know, this is what I have to do to win, so I'm going to do it. But don't worry, I'm going to change everything later. It's kind of, the thing is, that's kind of hard to take seriously. You know, Bernie Sanders would, said he would do something different. He said he was going to have uh, a, a, a campaign that was financed by the people, and he was going to work and be a man for and of the people. People, a lot, of, and a lot of people said that wouldn't work. And, well, I, I didn't think it would work either. I didn't think that a guy who had a campaign that was akin to, well, basically a Kickstarter, I didn't think a guy like that had a legitimate chance to be president. And as we can see, I and a lot of other people were wrong, as evidenced by well, Bernie Sanders kicking Hillary Clinton's ass in the New Hampshire, uh, in the New Hampshire caucuses. Uh, like, I mean, he won by it was over 20 or 30 points. Bernie beat that woman so bad that he earned the entire endor that he earned the endorsement of the entire NFL. That one's for you, Goodell, you punk bitch. Anyway, like, Bernie Sanders isn't just blowing smoke anymore. Like the guy is serious. He is a serious contender to actually beat Hillary Clinton and win the nomination. And if you read any polls, he would kick Donald Trump's ass in the general election. Per like, it's undeniable anymore. He's proven himself to be a viable and, well, electable and formidable candidate. If he can, like, if he can do this, if he can, you know, beat Hillary Clinton in New Hampshire and come back down from what, whatever it was, 25, 30 points in Iowa, what's stopping any of his other crazy, crazy ideas from working? Bernie Sa see, the thing about the, the appeal of Bernie Sanders is that he offers something to people that, to President Obama, it, was, it seemed like it was, more than, it was more or less just a catchphrase. And what he offers to them is hope gives Americans a glimmer of hope that maybe, just maybe, their democracy isn't owned by corporations. And that, if he, and that even if he loses, that maybe someone else like him, someone else maybe a little bit more, or well, a little younger and blacker, oh yeah, could, could I, could, could, uh, could come along and, you know, maybe initiate change. 
that was supposed to be like a th like maybe I'll run for president. So I'm never running for president. Fuck that. No. But uh, he, he like even if he as I was saying even if he loses he gives you hope that you know maybe it's possible that maybe the right candidate someone who's even better than Bernie Sanders can come along and win and get some actual change. If he wins, well, he really will be taking American democracy back from the wealthy or from the wealthy hands that stole it. Now, of course, that is until uh, the billionaire lizard people send Bill Cosby after him to drug him and then put him in a box and store him in a warehouse like they did in Indiana Jones. Okay, <clears throat> moving on to Antonin Scalia. Justice Scalia died uh, over the weekend, and this sent a shockwave across the political, the political scene, world, whatever the fuck you want to call it. Now, Article 2 of the Constitution gives the president the power to appoint a Supreme Court judge. Now, people are just waiting on who the president will nominate. Some people say it'll be Loretta Lynch. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't really care. Now, but... Here's the thing, there are some people who don't give a shit who he's going to nominate and are, will, and are just ready to strike down whoever, whomever that may be. Now, Senate Republicans initially, as soon as this happened, they initially vowed to block the president, whoever the president nominated, because they're afraid of him choosing someone who is too liberal, you know, they want the, the Supreme Court to be balanced, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, one thing Republicans have been citing to defend their rationale is a speech given by Senator Chuck Schumer in 2007. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, where was I? Chuck Schumer, 2007. Oh, yeah. Uh, he gave a speech uh, regarding uh, uh, nom potential nominees by former Governor George W. Bush. And, yes, I refuse to call him president because he stole the election. And fuck him. Anyway, um, basically, Republicans said that Chuck Schumer advocated pretty much the same thing that we're advocating. Others will argue that uh, his comments were taken out of context and that he was, he was only arguing that Bush nominees be vetted, then rejected. And what uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is doing is rejecting nominees before we... Before, really before we even get a chance to know who they are, before they're even named. Now, personally, I think it's partisan and kind of just a dick move by McConnell to reject uh, Obama's nominees before he even n nominates anyone. Like, he's basically just admitting what we've known for the last eight years, and that's that he just does not like President Black Panther. Now, I'm not excusing or defending what uh, Chuck Schumer said, you know, assuming, you know, just assuming that that's what he actually meant, because like I said, people are going back and forth with it. Now, I feel like all nominees, whomever they may be, should at least be considered uh, before you decide to just reject them off the basis of fuck you. Now, <clears throat> you, you can't see, the way I see it, you can't treat the the Supreme Court nomination process like this is Tinder. You can't just, just off the basis of how they look or something, just left swipe, left swipe, left swipe, right swipe, right swipe, right swipe, fuck you, left swipe. That's, that shouldn't be how politics works. You stop acting like a bunch of, well, millennials. Personally, I don't care who the president nominates because I frankly don't give a shit about the law. And, hold on. Yeah. Really? All right. Uh, yeah, my producer Tommy just informed me that the FBI is outside, so this is probably going to be my last show. Uh, yeah. Hashtag free Dave Shelton. Okay, anyway. As I was saying. Uh, Democrats say that Republicans didn't care about Obama's, Obama, Obama, and they, like, like, they didn't care about his, pro his stuff, <laughs> his policies or anything. All they wanted to do was sabotage his presidency, and pretty much everything he's tried to do. 
Well, here's Republicans, here's your chance to prove Democrats wrong. Listen to what the president has to say before you squash it. That's it. You, you, like, you always complain that Democrats don't work with you or give you a chance to work with them. Well, here is a chance to work with one. Now, it's arguable that Democrats tried to do the same thing you know, a, a few years back. But do yourselves a favor. Be the bigger men and women here not the bigger dicks. See, <clears throat> the way I see it, two wrongs do not make a right-wing nut job. I promise to never use a pun like that ever again. Uh, white privilege. Yep, I'm going there. Uh, it's a really contentious issue, but well, first, before I even get into it, let me define it. See, this is how, I just want to say, this is how we define white privilege. Now, white, it says, white privilege is a set of advantages and or immunities that white people benefit from on a daily basis beyond those common to all others. And, and it can exist without white people's conscious knowledge. Okay, we got that out of the way. Now, as I was saying, this is a really contentious issue in America. You have some people, uh, mostly people, you know, mostly people of color, and a lot of liberal whites, who, you know, they want to they say that white privilege exists. It's a problem, and we need to do things to end it. On the other side, you have people who don't think that way, and you say, you know, it. Uh, it, it, they don't think it exists, uh, and they feel threatened by the notion of it. It's offensive. You know, how is me being white, like how does me being white make my life better? Okay, well, we're gonna. Well, yeah, I'm about to tell you why being white makes your life better. <clears throat> but, like, okay, how, where does where to begin with this shit? Uh, I guess I'll start with the media. Now, there seems to, just to me, there seems to be a difference in the way that the media depicts criminals of color versus white criminals. What I mean by that is, uh, whenever we have, let's say, a mass shooting in this country committed by a white assailant, how often do political pundits emphasize that the shooter was a lone wolf or a bad egg? Uh, he needed help. He had mental issues. You know, if you know, he would have gotten the mental help that he needed, he wouldn't have done this, and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, on the other side of that, um, or, well, it, like, they're essentially eliciting... Sim it almost seems like they're eliciting sympathy for a guy who killed people. But, okay, there's that. Now, there's also another side to this, where, let's say, when a black person or a Muslim person or a Hispanic person commits a crime or a murder, then you see things like, um, like, like there's the narrative of, uh, thug culture influenced this, uh, or this person was a thug, this, per this was terrorism. Uh, I, hell, I've even seen things where it's, you know, if a Mexican person kills someone, then they use, they use it to justify, oh, just this hardline stance all against illegal immigration, and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, um, let, let's look at um, San Bernardino, okay? Um, or, well, you know what, fuck that. I'm going to use that as an example in a second. The way I see it is that it, you all, it's like there's, it almost takes, there's almost two different takes in the, the media has 
when talking about crime. Like I said, it's, it seems like eliciting, elic, eliciting, eliciting sympathy. Yeah, eliciting sympathy on one side when you say, when you say things, you know, th this person had mental issues and it caused them to go up a deep end rather than saying that this person was just a shitty person like they would do with uh, a Muslim committing a, a, an, like a, or well, they say, you know, this was an act of terror, which I'm not saying that, you know, it's, it's not. I'm just saying that when, when a white person commits something that you could consider an act of terror, it's not treated that way. It's treated as a, I don't want to say an accident, it's treated as the system failed this person, and now in this, this, it caused this person to go off the deep end. And when uh, a minority commits a crime, it's not. It, it's more this person failed society, or this person, or people like this person failed society and failed. I don't know, civilization in the system. Now, let's look at, um, well, let's look at terrorism. Uh, if, you, if you don't count the San Bernardino shooting, you don't count that. Domestic terrorism has killed twice as many people as Islamic terrorism. If you do count the San Bernardino shooting, well, Islamic terrorism still hasn't killed as many people as domestic terrorism. So, uh, where, like, the, I feel like our focus is shifted on the wrong thing here. I like, just, let's go to Oregon, actually. Look how the media, look how the media and the police treated a group of armed, like, Heavily armed white people. Uh, this is heavily armed white, pretty much all white militia that took over a government building in Oregon. No politician called for white people to be deported or to stop white immigrants from like, I don't know, Irish or Ireland. Wow, Irish. Jesus Christ. To stop immigrants from like Ireland or Canada or something. Like, now, I'll be fair here. They didn't kill anyone, but neither have unarmed and peaceful Black Lives Matter activists, you know, and they've been the subject of far more criticism than uh, these guys. Like, they've been subject to far more criticism from the media, like the mainstream media, than uh, these, these, these Oregon protesters. Like, on top, you know, just on top of being called uh, ugly, slime, and cop haters, you have people like good old Bill O'Reilly who say things like this, and I quote, fix my glasses. <clears throat> All right, I think they're a hate group. They hate police officers. They hate them. They want them dead. They're a hate group, and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to put them out of business. Good luck with that. And any media person who supports them, I'm going to put them on, on this program and put their picture up on, right up on the air. All right, Bill. Well, uh, contrary to popular belief, I am in the media. I may not have a lot of followers and no one really might know my name, but God damn it, I'm in the media. I don't care what anyone else says. And I also support Black Lives Matter. So, put my picture up on your show, Bill. I would really like to, I'd really like to see. You can have me on the show to even talk about this if you want to. I promise I won't even swear. That, like, that's, that's, how much I, that's how much I care here. If you put me on your show to talk about Black Lives Matter or white privilege or, or white privilege or whatever the 
fuck you want to talk about. I won't even say fuck or shit or damn or call you a pussy like I'm Donald Trump. Put me up on your show. I challenge you to do that. Because like I said, I may not have a, I, yeah, I don't have a lot of followers. But if you put me up on your show, well, hell, I could use the free publicity. Thank you. Now, on top of everything else that I just said, from Bill O'Reilly to people, to just, well, pretty much all of Fox News to, you know, the media refer, to people in the media referring to BLM as ugly and whatever. On top of that, they even, the media even has the nerve to link Black Lives Matter to criminal acts against cops. Now, imagine something for a second. Imagine if President Obama just said to deport white Christians because of the KKK or Cubans because of Ted Cruz. Conservatives probably, I feel like if, if the president said to do that, conservatives actually might get to see their dream come, become reality. And that dream is to see President Obama get lynched, from, get hung from a tree. You can deny it all you want, but we all know that's what you want to see. Oh, and uh, while we're on the media, the Super Bowl just passed a week or and a half or a week or two ago or something like that, at least from the, this taping. And, uh, <clears throat> well, just look at how Cam Newton was treated. See, he's been subject to a lot of criticism for a while now about, you know, he's dancing in the end zone and, you know, doing that and then that and then that and then all that stuff. He's been subject to a lot of criticism because of it. And uh, it didn't help that after uh, he was, after the Panthers lost in the Super Bowl, that uh, he abruptly left uh, the post-game press conference. And he caught a lot of shit for that. People said he was classless or childish. He even went so far as to make a large graphic about how long he stayed at the press conference and how many questions he answered. That is fucking bullshit. See, the reason he left early seems to be, just seems to be, uh, because an opposing player said that he couldn't throw. Now, if you're enough this guy is already heartbroken from a crushing defeat uh, by, uh, well, the Broncos and the Bill Clinton of the NFL, uh, Peyton Manning, he didn't want to deal with that anymore. He was heartbroken. And then to be told that he's not good at his job, he left before he got pushed over the edge. And I, 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 I personally, I have to applaud him for taking the high road. I mean, who the hell wants to be bothered by that? Just like, imagine if Stephen A. Smith got, just got his ass handed to him in a debate by Skip Bayless. And then, after that, he's told that he sucks at his job and he doesn't know sports. I'm pretty sure that he, I'm pretty sure he'd be a little pissed about that, you know? And by the way, can we just take time to appreciate that analogy? You know, flagrant black guy getting his ass kicked by, by one of the lamest white people in history. <laughs> and, then, you know, and then he gets taunted about it. Um, well, that, like that's a perfect comparison for the situation. And by the way, you're welcome. Dab. Anyway, moving on to Beyonce. Um, Twitter lost their shit, okay? Beyonce, uh, if you hadn't been, if you have been living under a rock, she uh, helped, she performed at the Super Bowl with Coldplay and Bruno Mars, and uh, Twitter just seemed to completely lose their shit. Uh, because Beyonce and her dancers, they had the, you know, they made a tribute to Black Lives Matter and uh, the Black Panthers during the halftime show. And 
for some reason, her performance was deemed hateful, racist, against, and yeah, hateful against cops, actually, racist. She, uh, Beyonce hates white people now. Fuck off, okay? Just fuck off. I'm, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to go into this. First of all, uh, supporting, su uh, showing, or sh not even supporting, but showing, just showing a tribute to the Black, to the Black Panthers isn't racist. Because here's the thing. The Black Panthers are not really a hate group. I mean, like, there are, there have been subdivisions that have broken off, and they've been classified as that. But the Black Panthers did not start as a hate group. They started out as a group that was trying to defend black people from just the history and at that time the present, da like the present danger of uh, hate, bigotry, and just outright violence. Like, like say if Beyonce had used uh, the, the image of the Confederate flag, which, I mean, no one has done before in their music. Yeah, just, I, ho I really hope that there's a graphic above my left shoulder. Because if there's not, I'm going to be, I'm going to look like a fucking idiot. And more of a fucking idiot than I usually do. Anyway, uh, if Beyonce had used the Confederate flag in, during her performance, I feel like that would be, she would be subject for criticism for that. Why? Because the Confederate flag is a symbol for racism. If you don't believe me, look at the fuck up. And it, not only that, but it's also a symbol of treason. If you're, if you're a patriot, I don't think you, a legit patriot, I don't think that you would like the use of the flag that was the, the, the symbol of the South during the War of Northern Aggression. I don't think you would like that. <clears throat> oh, and all, another thing. Okay, let's say if she came out in in support of the KKK, like she performed with a white sheet over her head, and like you know she's got the white sheet or something, or she's got a swastika on her arm or a Make America Great Again hat, like that. That would be racist. And it would also mean that she is Stacey Dash in disguise. But that, but more, more importantly, that would be racist. And this is the kind of shit that I'm talking about. If you support any black cause, like or any like any support of a black cause, is deemed as anti-police or anti-white, and that's not true. That's not how that works. And, and the simple fact that being pro-black is seen as being anti-white or anti-police that in and of itself is an issue it is a big problem that's how backwards and polarized we've become like, black people who contrary to popular belief I'm one of we're not against the police we're again what we're what we are against is the police getting like killing people. We love you. How many people